Welcome to this session on seed saving. My name is Dan Rubin. I am the owner and manager of Perfectly Perennial Herbs and Seeds, a tiny heritage seed company based in Pooch Cove, Newfoundland. And I'm sitting here in my living room today looking out at the snowy landscape uh, thinking uh, what an odd time of year to be doing a seed saving workshop. But in another way, this is a really good time because it's a great time for garden dreaming. And there is a lot of planning that also goes into seed saving to make sure that you have the right plants producing the right seed so that when the harvest time for seed comes in the fall, you can effectively glean, dry, and store the seeds from your own plants. There's a lot to know about this. It's quite complicated, but at the same time, it's really simple. You grow the plants, the plants flower, the flowers are pollinated, they produce seed. You wait until the seed is ripe, you harvest the seed in various ways, depending on how it's packaged. You dry it very, very thoroughly, and then you store it in well-labeled containers in a cool, dry place. And if you do that, many seeds will retain their vitality. Uh, they'll germinate uh, after quite a few years if they're stored well. So we're here today to talk about seed saving and what it is and why it's important and how to do it. Uh, I've been a seed saver for many years, certainly in the 17 years that I've lived here in Newfoundland. It's become a very important part of what we do. As a seed company, it's our job to propagate the plants and then harvest the seed. And when we do that, in particular, year after year, we are participating in a process called roguing, which is the gradual, selective harvesting of seed that is well adapted to our place and our climate. And that's exactly how most of the major food crops that we have were evolved through the interaction between humans and the plants by selection, in some cases by hybridization, in some cases by capturing errant varieties or mutations that produced even tastier, larger grain or fruit or vegetables. Okay, what is a seed? Well, a seed is something that was created when plants discovered sex. That is, when in the evolution of plant life, plants began the system of combining pollen and the ovum of a flower to produce a new combination of genetic material, they created a system in which plants could adapt combining traits from generation to generation and better survive and deal with changes in environment and climate. And so the flowering plants were created and now we have a system that is the basis for most plant life on earth, not all of it, but much of it. And as a result, we have all kinds of benefits that we harvest in the form of food. So when the pollen is delivered to the flower and pollinates the flower, a seed is formed. And seeds emerge in various kinds of plants in different ways. Sometimes within a, a fruit that is there to protect it and to decompose and to feed it when the seed sprouts. Sometimes a seed forms uh, at the top of an umbel where many, many seeds are produced by a cluster of flowers. Sometimes the seed is formed inside a pod, as with peas or beans, and then the pod dries out and the seeds can be dispersed. The dispersal mechanisms for seeds are truly amazing. I mean, some seeds are in fruit that is meant to be ingested and then pooped out, uh, enriched by the fertilizer that the animal that's eaten the fruit leaves behind. Those seeds are adapted to go right through the digestive tract on their way to being replanted. Some seeds have hard casings 
that are impervious to weather and allow them to survive for years before germinating. Pine seeds, for example, need f fire in some cases to heat them, uh, to crack their outer shell before they can germinate, to ensure that they're sprouting in a place that's been prepared for this pine tree's growth. Other seeds have um, umbrellas like dandelion seeds that'll float through the air and transport the seed to a new place. These dispersal mechanisms are quite fascinating and varied. So what does a seed look like? Well, this is a seed. This is an avocado seed. If you immerse it in water and if it's still alive, it will sprout and form an avocado tree. This is an acorn from an oak tree. This is also a seed, a bare seed with a hard shell. This is a peach seed, which has to crack and open and allow the plant embryo to emerge. Peas and beans have hard seeds that form within pods, and we eat those seeds as food. One of the ways that we harvest foods from plants is to eat their seeds. And um, they have their own conditions necessary for germination, but once dried, they can be stored, as you know, as storable food or as seeds to be replanted. Here are some citrus seeds. Here are some orange and lemon seeds that I harvested that I'm planning to plant to produce trees for lemons. And some seeds are so tiny that it's very difficult to plant an individual seed, like the seeds of carrots or lettuce or kale or broccoli. Those seeds are very tiny. So the thing about seeds is that they have bundled within them the complete genetic information for the plant and the variety and the species that they will produce when they sprout and germinate. And when we participate in that cycle of seed germinating to produce plant, to produce leaves, to grow toward the sun, to produce flowers, to then become germinated and create new seeds, we're intervening in a way. We're doing a dance with nature which is how I like to think about the whole process of what I do in the garden as a dance with nature. We're intervening, but we're also participating in the harvesting, the storage, and then the dispersal of those seeds when we replant them. Seed saving is really important. It's way more important now even than it was a hundred or a thousand years ago, simply because large corporate entities, Monsanto and Syngenta and the other two, there's only really four of them, four large companies controlling most of the agricultural seed production around the world now, they've taken over and they've turned plants and they've turned food and they've turned seeds into a commodity under their control. They've even gone so far as to create new varieties and then patent them, put their stamp of ownership on these seeds. And that has dire consequences for all of us in terms of food security, in terms of the loss of biodiversity. And so seed saving has become a radical act, a way of counteracting that loss of biodiversity and that loss of community control over seeds and over food. So as a seed saver you should be proud. I am proud that I am participating in saving rare seeds in particular from loss, from extinction. And for us that includes some varieties of kale, it includes the Vantage greenhouse tomato about which I can find almost nothing online even though they were grown commercially for decades here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So, seed saving. What are we doing when we save seeds? We are going out into the surroundings, out into nature, or out into our garden, and at exactly the right time, that's point one, timing, 
we are gathering seed from the plants. And depending on how those seeds are produced and packaged, the gathering of the seed happens in different ways. So later in this workshop, I will demonstrate one of the more uh, esoteric forms of seed saving, which is how you seed save from soft fruits like tomatoes and peppers, because there's a bit more to that. But in many cases, the way seeds are presented to us for our harvest of those seeds is within pods or containers of some kind that the plant produces. So, for example, when I grow kale, which is a biennial, in the second year, it's, it grows really tall and it goes to seed. At first, there are yellow flowers on the ends of the stalks, those yellow flowers are pollinated by pollinators flying around. Because I grow a single type of kale, I don't have great worries about them crossing and producing errant varieties. We'll talk about that in a minute. Isolation of seed crops. And then the seed pods that form are long, well, they're not very large, they're about this big. They're sickle-shaped pods with tiny little seeds in them that start out white and then turn brown and finally black. Okay, so one year I made a mistake and so did a number of my friends. We harvested those seed pods when they were still slightly green and we hung them up and we let them dry and then we shucked out the seed. Well, that seed was no good very low germination. And the reason turned out to be that we did not let the seed pods go fully ripe. So we're talking now about point number one, which is timing. If at all possible, when you are harvesting seed for seed saving, you want the seed to go fully mature before it is harvested. And in the case of the kale, that meant very carefully watching the seed pods as they turned yellow and then brown because at a certain point they start splitting open and scattering seed. That's one of the things that I love about our kale is that it is a biennial with two years worth of beautiful red Russian kale leaf production. After which um, it forms the seed pods which we can then harvest as seed savers and uh, those plants produce a lot of seed. It's a really great seed crop to be growing. Uh, the West Coast kale that we harvest and then distribute to other growers. So timing is number one. Number two point, and it's so important, is that seeds be thoroughly dried. So what does that mean? That means when the seed is gathered, it needs to be placed in a warm, dry place, indoors preferably, not in the sun, where the seed can dry. And it needs to dry for days and days, preferably for a week or more. For large seeds like beans or peas, uh, it may take a full two weeks for the seed to dry. If it's not dry and you store it in a closed container, uh, you will lose that seed. It will go moldy. It will go bad. It will rot. So dry, dry, dry. That's point number two. The third point, and I will demonstrate this later in the workshop by taking you to where we store our seed, is that you store it in a cool, dry enclosure or container but you also label very carefully the plant that it came from, the variety that it came from, and the year that you harvested it. Now the way to determine whether seed is still viable is to do something called a germination test. And again, we'll demonstrate that later in this workshop. So let's talk about the actual act of seed harvesting and seed saving.
For a change of pace, I thought I'd step into the kitchen, which is actually a place where I do some of my seed saving activities, as I will show you later on. So now we're going to talk about the details of how you save seeds. And it's important to recognize that there are different kinds of plants, different types of life cycles that plants have that affect how you save seed. What I'm talking about is annuals, biennials, and perennials. An annual is a plant that grows and goes to flower and produces seed every single year. A biennial has a two-year cycle, first year of growth, second year of seed production. And that would include things like kale or carrots or turnips that go to seed in the second year. And then there are perennials that live on year after year in your garden or in nature and tend to produce seeds every year. So some examples of annuals uh, from which you would be harvesting seed would be things like lettuce or tomatoes. Uh, biennial plants include carrots and beets, and as I mentioned, kale. And perennials, well, is a whole bunch of flowering plants that would fall into the category of being perennials, and that would include many of the herbs as well, from which you can harvest seed. The other thing to know about is self-pollinating versus cross-pollinating plants. So in self-pollinating plants, the pollen doesn't travel from one plant to another. It pollinates another flower on the same plant. Whereas some plants are cross-pollinated. They rely on pollen being delivered from a different plant. And that is essential to pollination of the flower. So depending on what type of plant you're harvesting seed from, annual, biennial, perennial, self-pollinating or cross-pollinating, in order to get true breeding seeds, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, you may need to isolate the plants from which you are harvesting seed to make sure that they stay true to type. And there are prescribed isolation distances for different things. For peas and beans, for example, which can be pollinated by bees and other insects flying through the air, uh, these are significant distances and you need to know what they are for each type of seed. I won't get into presenting a chart of those. You go look for that information. It is available online. Isolation distances, that's what you're searching for. So let's talk about some of the common vegetable seeds that you might be harvesting. Let's start with lettuce. Lettuces are unusual uh, in how they complete their cycle and go to seed. Uh, they don't dry down. Uh, they grow up and form a seed stalk with flowers up the stalk. A single lettuce can produce hundreds of seeds from the yellow flowers atop its stalk. So you don't have to harvest a lot of stalks from a lot of plants to have sufficient lettuce seed for your own garden. If you're a commercial seed producer, however, you would want to be harvesting from many plants. And lettuce seeds, like the seeds of the kale that I mentioned earlier, have to be fully dried, so you need to keep an eye on them. They're usually collected in September or October. Um, and you want to be uh, gathering them from plants that you've identified as good producers for your situation and your climate. Because I realize in these workshops I'm talking to people right across the country from here on the East Coast out through Ontario and the prairies to BC. Waving to you folks out there. I used to live in the Gulf Islands of BC. Tomatoes are wonderful but they require a special technique for harvesting their seed, and I will demonstrate that just a bit later in this workshop. Beans are dead easy. All you really need to know is let some of the pods go ripe, let them dry, harvest the peas and beans from inside the pod when they are fully mature and, in fact, a bit dry in the fall. Grains are self-pollinating annuals. Peppers, we'll talk about peppers when we get to the tomatoes, basically the same 
story on how you harvest and dry the seed. Um, and those are the self-pollinated annuals. Cross-pollinated annuals would include broccoli, corn, cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, and then other greens like spinach, amaranth. And for those, uh, you're going to want to have the, the cross-pollination happen between plants, but hopefully not between varieties so that you end up with hybrids. So how do you promote that? Well, in the case of corn, you plant a lot of corn very close together in a clump. In our raised beds, we would be planting 30 or even 40 corn seeds or starts into a 20 square foot bed so that when the wind blows and the pollination happens, there's an intense amount of pollination. Because, for example, in corn, to get full production on the corn cob, every single one of those mini flowers in the corn need to be pollinated. So you need to deliver a lot of pollen to the corn silk to have it move down and pollinate uh, the corn kernels. Because there's a significant difference between hybrid seeds and true breeding or open pollinated OP seeds. If you look in a seed catalog, you will often see labeling, this is an OP seed, open pollinated. That means that it is a single variety that self-pollinates and is true breed. So what you're looking for, particularly, are heritage, true breeding, open pollinated varieties from which you can save your seeds. And that's one of the ways that we can keep these almost lost varieties and the biodiversity that they represent protected and maintained. So now we're ready to get into the practical details of seed harvesting, cleaning, and storage. And uh, if it were not February, because I'm recording this in February, I'd be able to go out into the garden and show you the stalks of the seed pods on my kale plants. We'd be able to watch them uh, mature and go brown and finally dry. Uh, I would be cutting those stems and putting them upside down in plastic buckets in my shed or greenhouse where they could further dry and ripen. And then I would bring them in and with scissors, I would cut off the seed pods into a bowl and I would shuck the seeds out of the seed pods uh, by using my hands and rubbing the seed pods between my hands and working them, kneading them, so that the seeds that were already dry would pop out of the dried pods. That's a basic seed harvesting technique. And the result would be I would have a bowl full of seeds and dried empty pods. And after that process of winnowing, I would need to separate the two. And I would do that by, first of all, picking up the obvious empty seed pods from the top, because the seeds will have drifted to the bottom of the bowl, particularly if I shake it, and throwing those away. Those, of course, would go into the compost to be returned to the garden, complete the cycle. And at the bottom, I would end up with a bunch of seeds from the kale, that would look kind of like this. These are kale seeds that were dried several years ago. And you can see they're round little tiny black hard balls. And so to further clean them, I might do something like this. And this is where simple, ordinary kitchen tools would come in really handy. I might take a colander like this, put it over a bowl, pour the seeds through it, I'll only do a few of these, but I'll show you how this is done. And then by shaking this, I would let the seeds fall through into the bowl. And if I were doing this for real, beginning with a mixture of seeds and chaff, the chaff would remain in the colander. And I might do that several times, and I might also clean the seed from debris that's smaller than the seed by 
Where's the nice nutty bowl? Okay. By taking the seed that's now partially clean and sieving it through a series of sieves that would remove some of the debris and chaff, which is still in the seeds, leaving behind clean seeds. And then those, once they are thoroughly dried, and it might take an additional several days of drying out in the open in a warm indoor place, then those can be put into a container. And uh, old peanut butter jars are perfect for this because if you drop them, they're plastic and they're not going to break very easily. And you can store, as you can see, thousands of seeds in a standard size peanut butter jar if they're tiny kale seeds. Not so much if they're larger seeds. And once thoroughly dried, the jar can be sealed and stored in a cool place and labeled on the top. In this case, it says 2017-2018 West Coast Kale. I have newer kale seeds than this. These kale seeds, even though they're now five years old, right? Uh, you know, four years old, could still be fairly good. And I will know by doing a germination test which I will demonstrate in this workshop. So many vegetable seeds can be harvested and the debris from them <laughs> can be thrown away and you end up with cleaned seeds. So harvesting when fully mature is a key for vegetable seeds. Then seed cleaning, which I was just demonstrating. For peas and beans, that's dead easy because the pods are about this big and it's so easy you just pop the dried seeds out and there you go. Now for other seeds that come from some vegetables and particularly the things that we call vegetables but they're actually fruits, involves a little bit more work. So we'll talk about the seed harvesting for those plants next. So what is a fruit? Well, a tomato is a fruit. But let's start with some much more obvious ones like an apple. How do you harvest seeds from an apple? Well, you cut the apple open and there are the seeds. Very simple and easy. There's an apple seed from inside an apple. We all know that they're there. That seed still would need to be dried very thoroughly before a bunch of apple seeds could be saved and then replanted. But one of the things about fruits, whether it's pomes, like apples and pears, or droops, like almonds and peaches and nectarines and plums, is that these seeds will not necessarily produce the same fruit as the tree they came from because most fruit is grafted. Most fruit trees are grafted to rootstock that is adapted for the climate that the tree grows in and to define the size of the tree. So this seed is a lottery ticket. With citrus, and we do grow citrus as indoor plants. Meyer lemons are my favorite. Uh, you slice open the fruit, you find the seeds inside, and you're ready to go. So what about tomatoes? Tomatoes are fruit. Well, that requires a little bit of technique. And here's what you do. Now here's a very overripe tomato that's been sitting around for quite a while. It's really squishy. It's drowning in its own juice. So here's the technique for harvesting and drying tomato seed. You take the tomato and you squeeze out the seeds. And you can see that the seeds are all mixed up with the pulp of the tomato, and that's normal. And you squish the pulp up, which is what I'm doing with my fingers. And then you want to separate those tomatoes from the massive pulp. So you can do that by using a screen and by washing down the pulp. And this is exactly what large-scale seed producers are doing uh, in huge quantities using larger machines and technology in Southeast Asia and places in India and places where seed is being produced. So once the seed and the pulp are in the screen you can use your fingers or a spoon and mash it around 
because you're going to end up pushing a lot of the juice and much of the pulp through the screen. And you're going to end up with a mixture of pulp and seeds, which is fine. And then you're going to take that mixture of pulp and seeds from the tomato and you're going to put it into a container and you're going to add water and you're going to float those seeds and the pulp that remains in the water for a matter of several days. And the reason you're doing that is that these seeds, these tomato seeds, let's see if I can pick one out. Yeah, there's one. These tomato seeds are encased in a little transparent kind of shield of pulp. And that shield, that encasing shield, will rot away. Now this tomato that I just squished up was pretty old and soggy. So some of the seeds are already bare, and you can see that. And what you want to do is continue to separate seed from pulp. And you do that by leaving them immersed in water for up to a week. And so then once you've done that, I'm just going to rinse this screen off. So once you do that, you're ready to take the seeds in the water, put it into a screen, and wash away the remaining pulp. And again, you can use your fingers to mush the seeds around, and you'll end up with basically bare seeds that have been stripped from their surrounding envelope and are ready to dry. So once you're ready to actually dry your tomato seeds, they've been stripped of their little encasing shield, and they've been separated from the pulp, well, then you have tomato seeds ready to dry. And the two methods that I've used that seem to work really well for this are one is to put them into a storage container and kind of separate, separate them from each other so that they're uh, somewhat isolated. And then as they dry, uh, once they're quite dry, you can kind of shut, strip them off there and put them away to store. But once again, they have to be really thoroughly dried. And that means after they put in a, a container like this, uh, they're going to continue to dry for at least a week. Because although they're small, they have to lose water to be safe to store. And the other method that's traditionally used for tomato seeds that I kind of like in a way is to put them on to a piece of paper towel like this and then spread them out because if you spread them out really well using your fingers or using an implement like a spoon or a fork, you get individual tomato seeds separated from each other in space on the paper towel. And you put that out uh, somewhere to dry in a warm indoor place. And once they dry, they're going to stick to that paper towel. So if they're well separated, you can actually take scissors out or pull apart those little pieces of paper with the tomato seeds stuck to them, which makes them even easier to handle when it's time to plant. So those are some seed saving and seed cleaning basics. Seed cleaning can get a lot more complicated or at least larger if you have large quantities of seed to winnow and to clean. And seed cleaning was an industry everywhere that grain was growing that has been pushed out of existence by Monsanto and the other big seed companies because they didn't want seed cleaners going around making it possible for farmers to save and replant their own wheat and corn and soy. So the traditional business of seed cleaning in the prairies and in the Midwest of the United States, uh, which was a thriving industry until 30, 40 years ago, has been a victim of the corporate seed takeover. But for us home gardeners, seed harvesting, seed cleaning, and seed drying and saving are uh, vitally important, available, and you don't need much to do, do it. Uh, a few bowls, a few 
screens, a few colanders, some tools. It's not hard. You can do it. How about uh, harvesting seeds from a pepper? Well, that's easy. Cut the pepper open and the seeds are inside. And you just strip them out. There they are. You put them away to dry and within a several days or a week you'll have dried pepper seeds ready to put into storage. And you can keep those again once they're thoroughly dry in a plastic container labeled in this case peppers uh, 2013 and actually I've got several different years of pepper in here. I just haven't updated my label. This is four or five years of pepper seed. And once again the question comes up how do you know if these seeds are still good? And the simple answer is that you do a germination test. And you take a specified number of pepper or other seeds that you want to test and uh, to get a really accurate count you would use a hundred but we're not going to be that scientific. We're going to go do a much simpler test and you find the seeds that you want to test and you put them on some paper towel and to be fair you pick the best looking seeds. You don't, you know, if seeds are old and really looking crappy there's no point in testing them. So you pick your best seeds and you put out, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seeds. So that's going to give you a percentage out of ten, eight, nine. Mm, I need one more. Ten. So I've got ten seeds here on a little piece of paper towel. And what I do is I leave them right there. I cover them with another flap of paper towel. I pour some water over them and I get the paper towel damp. There's my damp paper towel. And you can see that the seeds are now there and they're damp. And you put them into a container like this plastic tray and you put them away for four or five days in a warm, dark place. And if they're viable, they will sprout, they will germinate. You will see the, the seeds split open and the first seed leaves, the cotyledons, come out. And depending on how many of those ten sprout, that would give you times ten a percentage of germination. And that is the indicator of the viability of your seed. So that makes it very easy to test the viability of seed when it's several years old and find out if what you have in a seed package that you bought years ago or that you saved yourself some years past is still good. So what about plants that reproduce vegetatively, including flowering plants that also create tubers underground or bulbs below ground that can be replanted? and that divide underground and therefore you can continue propagating them from the root. Well, uh, in that case, potato seed, for example, is just a potato. You can see the little eye beginning to grow a root. And so I would find two places on this potato where eyes are going to form. I might cut it in half, put it outside for that surface to dry, and then it'd be ready to plant in the spring or even in the fall to overwinter and come up in the spring. And the key there is to plant them with the growing side uh, up to form the, plant, the new plant and they'll grow from there and of course they'll be growing exactly the same variety as the potato that you started with. Uh, in the case of uh, garlic, we all know that garlic forms bulbs underground and that the garlic bulbs are composed of cloves so you can break off the, uh, the garlic oh, cloves and they're ready to plant next year. Uh, that's the growing tip on the top which will come up as a green stalk and here's the flat bottom 
where it was originally rooted and it'll form new roots and grow. So that's a garlic clove ready to plant. That's another example of vegetative reproduction. And the final one that I want to show you, and it's one of our favorite seed crops, are these delightful onions that form on the top of stalks on the walking onions, the Egyptian onions. These little bulbos or bulblets form and you can break them off and replant them. They'll form roots on the bottom as you can see and stalks on the top. And these are a true perennial that never forms an underground onion bulb, but they're wonderful greens, a full foot and a half high, an inch thick, delicious and sweet. So we love this perennial onion that we grow and it produces bulbils on the top of stalks every fall, which form these baby onions, these bulbils that we can harvest and replant. That's another vegetative reproductive system. One of the finest things about seed saving is that it's not about just growing or harvesting your own seed. It's really about seed sharing. Because the seed that you harvest or that your neighbors or friends in a community garden harvest and clean and save allows a community of people to exchange the materials that they're growing and keep those varieties going. And as I said, seed saving has become a radical act, a way of participating and preserving biodiversity and ensuring that we'll have varieties that will do well as our climate changes into the future. So I'm really glad if you're watching this, I encourage you to get involved in seed saving if you have any questions for me, email me. I'm always happy to answer questions. My email is info at perfectlyperennial.ca. And before we finish, I want to suggest some seed houses that I like getting my seed from, which I then, of course, can grow and save myself and share with my neighbors. because I'm on the east coast of Canada, Annapolis seeds and Vessies and Hope seeds, among others, are our favorites, as well as high mowing seeds in Vermont, a wonderful company with a huge history of dedication to organic growing. And the equivalent on the west coast of Canada would be West Coast seeds and Salt Spring seeds, both of which are fine companies. Uh, but there are almost a hundred seed companies across Canada. And most importantly of all, there is Seeds of Diversity, which is our national heritage seed network. I am so grateful for the work that they do, and I encourage you to join them, to become a member. The way you do that is you go to seeds.ca, and all the information is there, including a list of, as I said, almost a hundred seed companies in Canada. So to finish off, I want to suggest some resources that you may want to know about if you want to continue the journey in seed saving. And here are some books that I've pulled off of my shelves behind me, uh, my overcrowded bookshelves that I want to share with you that I've collected over the last several years. This is Suzanne Ashworth's book, Seed to Seed, Seed Saving and Growing Techniques for Vegetable Gardens, published by Chelsea Green in the United States. This is Seed Sowing and Saving Step-by-Step -Step Techniques by Carol Turner, published by Stories Garden Skills, a Canadian publisher. Seed Savers Exchange in the United States, the U.S. equivalent of Seeds of Diversity, started by farmer Ken Wheely, published this beautiful illustrated book, The Seed Garden, uh, The Art and Practice of Seed Saving by Lee Butala and Shanine Siegel, and that's available from Seed Savers. We have the handbook produced by Seeds of Diversity in Canada, how to Save Your Own Seeds, a handbook for small-scale seed production. This is a hugely wonderful, compact guide to seed saving, and it is available from Seeds of Diversity. And finally, 
The Complete Guide to Saving Seeds, 322 Vegetable, Herb, Flower, Fruit, Trees, and Shrub Seed Techniques. Preserving Favorite Tastes and Scents by Robert Goff and Cheryl Moore Goff, and that was published by Story. So those are some references that you might seek out if you want to continue the journey in seed saving. It's been wonderful to be able to speak to you this way. I want to thank Seeds of Diversity for sponsoring these videos which have been produced and distributed during CD Saturday events across Canada this year, 2021. And I wish all of you a wonderful garden year and many years to come.